So welcome to the PTL webinar series. Today we have Mark Washenberger uh, reviewing image services, Julian Dejo reviewing telemetry, and John Griffith reviewing block storage. We're going to have Mark go first. Um, again, about 20 minutes for each speaker to review the latest for their OpenStack projects. Mark, um, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Margie, and um, thanks to the OpenStack Foundation for creating this opportunity for us to get some visibility into our project. So, as Margie said, I'm Mark Washenberger, and I've been the PTL of the OpenStack Image Service, or um, the code name that we have for this client, um, throughout the Havana release cycle and the Ice House release cycle, which we're in now. And so. Uh, moving on to the next slide, I uh, just want to, before we get started, give you a brief overview of what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, first, I'll give you a sense of some of the progress that we made during the Havana release cycle and cover some statistics about our contributor base through Havana. And then I should have some time to talk about the progress that we've already made in Icehouse that we're about almost halfway through the Icehouse development cycle, and the plans for what we hope to complete. Um, so starting with Havana progress, I'll just talk to you about some of these features. Um, the first one that we implemented is something we're calling image property protection. And for those of you who aren't already very familiar with Plant, an image property is a sort of free form uh, piece of data about an image. It's basically a set of key-value pairs. Um, and the way to think about this feature is as a, a bit of uh, deployer configuration that can restrict who can read and who can write um, different keys for images. Um, and restrictions are based on the role of the user, um, so it's role-based. And in addition to read and write, also we separate out you know, who can add a property, who can remove a property, and things like that. Uh, this has a couple of important use cases. They're all sort of centered around this idea of ensuring trust. So a deployer restricts certain types of keys so they can only be edited by trusted parties. And that's really important when it comes to image sharing. You can imagine a, a, a deployer could communicate to their users, you know, you can trust this certain bit of information about an image. You know, no one no random third party could show up and just edit it, um, even if they own the image. Um, so that sort of creates a chain of trust there. Uh, it's also useful for certain accounting use cases. You can imagine um, uh, an image property that the user themselves cannot read and cannot edit. So you could put something like your licensing information or different uh, billing related attributes, embed them directly on the image, and trust that the user didn't just change it uh, in order to get a lower, <laughs> lower billing rate. Um, taking a look at the next feature, um, this is something we're calling the Registry API v2. I think you need a little bit of background. Um, there's two APIs in Glance. There's the Images API, which is the externally publicly facing one, and then there's this private one called the Registry. Um, and in v1 of the Images API, um, all communication to the database was mediated through the registry. Uh, this caused some problems for some users in terms of, uh, or sorry, some deployers in terms of performance bottlenecks. And so when we wrote the V2 images API, we cut the registry out of the loop. But that also, that solution causes some problems for certain deployers uh, who like the deployment pattern of having a restriction on the access to the database. So we created this V2 registry API. It's really just a very thin RPC wrapper on top of how we talk to our database. So in the V2 images API, uh, we can basically imagine that we're talking to the database, but now we're actually, we can actually talk to the registry uh, V2 API instead. And so that makes it an optional, it makes it optional to maintain this registry deployment pattern. Uh, this will help us uh, as we move forward and, and try to uh, deprecate some of the things that we don't want to keep anymore. Um, then taking a look at the next feature, uh, this is something that we're calling 
uh, multiple locations per image. Glance generally doesn't store the image data itself. It has drivers for storing uh, the images out in, in some other service, say for example Swift. Um, and so we track the location of where that's stored. What we did during Havana was expanded the model a bit so that there can be multiple locations that we store for where an, where an image data is. So a deployer can set up replicas for certain images. Uh, this immediately offers opportunities for increased availability um, because if the first one fails uh, or is it just not immediately not available, Glance will skip on to the next replica. And we're also looking at features to make this um, improve download performance. So you can imagine Glance or even eventually a client saying, well, this location is closer to me or it's faster for me for some reason, so I'll select that one. Um, I think the next, uh, yeah, moving on to the next feature set. We also, I, I mentioned those storage drivers or backends. We added several more of those. Um, we added um, the ability for Glance to represent cinder uh, uh, backed images. Uh, we're still working out some of the details here. Oh, when I say Cinder, I should, should clarify that's the um, OpenStack uh, block storage project. So the the idea behind that is to get to this point where we have zero copies, and you can, when you say I want to boot an instance, a uh, Nova instance from this image, you know you're actually sort of under the hood doing a boot from volume that's available. Uh, but we're still working out some of the details there because it, it slightly complicates our model. So we'll look for more from that in Ice House and beyond. Uh, we also added support for GridFS and Sheepdog stores. So if you have those, uh, it's a little bit easier now to store your images. Uh, in so I think we can move along to the contributor statistics. During Havana, uh, for the Glance uh, project itself, we had about 60 contributors uh, spanning across about 30 companies. And all told, it was 250 patches, uh, fixing about 130 bugs. Um, in terms of lines of code, we actually grew quite a bit during Havana. Um, I think we're up to nearly 50,000 lines now, and so we added about 18,000 of those during Havana. Uh, fortunately, uh, in terms of the way I'm concerned about these things, most of those lines were test, so that's that's good. Um, so looking at what we've already done in Icehouse, we've already fixed uh, 43 bugs that we were tracking. And we've implemented a, a, a bit of features already. One in particular, we switched our notification mechanism to using Oslo messaging, which has some good internal benefits. Uh, I think it makes us work perhaps a bit better with um, Julian's project. Uh, <laughs> I think. And we've also made a lot of progress on a blueprint called asynchronous tasks, which I'll talk about a bit more here in just a moment. Um, but looking ahead in Icehouse, we talked at the Icehouse Design Summit about what are we going to do with the V1 Images API and how are we going to move beyond it. Um, and we came up with a schedule. Uh, which I can sort of outline here. There's a number of, of preparations that we need to make in Icehouse in order to make this work. Uh, if we do everything as we're planning, we should be able to mark the image API v1 as deprecated in Juno. So uh, I guess in about you know, nine months or so when people get Juno, the Juno release, um, if they're running v1, everything will still work, but uh, there will be some warnings that pop up say, hey, this is going to go away. And then the plan is that that should enable us to actually remove the code in the K release. Um, now in terms of some ICOP features, I, I mentioned these asynchronous tasks or asynchronous operations. And I'll drill down a bit more on that now. Um, formerly, the, the image is API is all basically synchronous operations. So you, know, you upload an image and wait until you're done, uh, or things like that. And we found that that's a bit limiting uh, for certain 
types of use cases where um, you want some processing to run in the background or something that's pretty likely to, to fail for a variety of reasons, you know, if, if it's invalid, but the, the data itself has some problem where it's invalid. You don't find out towards the end of the process or until the end of the process. So we've been working pretty hard on adding a framework for supporting and exposing these asynchronous operations where users can initiate them and poll and track that they're, you know, how they're progressing and did they succeed, did they fail. And the use cases that we're targeting at first are something we're calling image import and export. An import, rather than directly uploading the data to Glance, what you would do is make it available in some form, say, Storing it um, on your in your Swift container or something like that, um, and you'd say, "Hey, Glance, go create an image for me out of these bits that I have over here in this format." And that offers the opportunity for uh, deployers to configure on the back end a conversion step, you know, that, or even in validation, um, different things that uh, players are interested in um, to make it so that people can bring images to their cloud. Um, similarly, we have the export use case, which is just sort of in reverse, where you say, hey, Glance, um, I've got this image stored in Glance. It's in some deployer-specific format or whatnot, and I'd like to take it and use it somewhere else. And so you could say, export this image, put it in my Swift container, make sure it's in you know, a raw, bare format. Um, and so that should be really useful for interoperability. Uh, moving forward. On the deployer side of things, we've been looking at you know, how should this operate, how should these asynchronous operations work, um, and we've been targeting two different deployment mechanisms at first. One sort of maximizes convenience and probably is not so great on the performance side. You can think of this as a dev stack use case um, where the uh, the import and export is actually running asynchronously in a local thread to the clamp process. But we want to be able to scale this out as well. And so we have been looking at um, uh, assigning the work out to workers um, that we're communicating to over RPC, sort of like how things work in Nova. Moving along to the next uh, feature. I mentioned to you this idea of having multiple locations per image. And to really get the most out of that um, data structure, we need to have strategies that say, you know, in this circumstance, pick this image location type. Uh, and so we've been working on adding those kinds of strategies, making them configurable in Glance. Uh, this should help. Uh, optimize, really optimize the download performance and have some improvements in availability as well. Um, this isn't something that we've specifically talked about, but it's sort of an, uh, a use case you can imagine you could have, um, if you wanted to store your images on S3, you could store, you could say always use the uh, reduced redundancy copy, um, and then if that doesn't work, move on to the frozen copy. So that would give you really great availability, better performance, etc. Um, moving along, uh, we I really just scratched the surface of our ice house plans. There's lots of blueprints that we are discussing or we've approved. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to mention that we'll continue to talk about these blueprints and other features. Uh, at our mid-cycle mini summit, which is happening later this month uh, in the DC area. Um, a bit sparse on details here. However, uh, if you take a look at the OpenStack Dev uh, mailing list archive, you can get more info in case you something that you might be interested in. So that about covers it for me. And so I'm going to look and see if we have any questions. We don't seem to have any questions uh, in the chat right now. I don't know if anybody um, have any questions they just want to ask? You are now unmuted. And I had the lines muted, so I just unmuted the lines if anyone wants to ask Mark any questions. And if not, that's fine. I'll uh, be around at the end for the general questions. Hi, guys. For having me. Hi, guys. Hello? Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yes. Hi, it's uh, Dimitri. Uh, I, I have a question in regards to using uh, 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 the current solution in uh, uh, IceHouse for uh, storing uh, uh, deployment artifacts of past the Historum and Murano uh, uh, artifacts. So uh, my question is, uh, is it will be a part of the glance or it will be a separate solution? So that is a, a topic that has come up um, sort of as we've been working on Icehouse. And so I, I didn't include it here, but it's definitely something that's on our radar. And it's something that we want to discuss and figure out the details um, during that mid-cycle mini-summit. Um, it definitely feels like there's a lot of overlap in terms of general use case. When it's, or the image service has obviously been very focused on images so far, but um, it hasn't really bothered with images that much. It's been much more of a general gatekeeper in terms of, you know, users show up with this data, Glance validates it and stores it in a continuously valid form and makes it available in Nova. So I think there's a lot of overlap and we just need to figure out all the details for how how to expand scope and what's practical in terms of the code. <coughs> Thank you very much. And do you think it will be resolved for uh, Ice House or for the later releases? Mm, I, it really depends on what, what strategy we go with, and we haven't picked it yet. Um, it's possible to do something kind of quick and dirty and, and expose it in Ice House, but that really only leaves us a very short development cycle to get that working. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think we'll just have to figure out what what we feel like is the right answer uh, at the mini summit. Sorry, I can't give you more detail. Oh, it does look like we have another question in the chat. Um, not sure that I can see the whole question, but I guess uh, the question is about uh, tenant and user quotas um, in uh, in Glance. We did actually in Havana add um, sort of dumb. Uh, image quota system where you can say across the board users can only have um, a certain amount of storage per uh, sorry, per tenant. Um, it's not really configurable uh, per tenant, however. It's just an across the board setting. The quotas we've had a bit of a rough time with in, in Glance because it's, it's kind of an interesting question. Do you care about how many images? Do you care about how much storage? Do you care about where it's stored? You know, as we can store across multiple backends, and so we have something to offer there, but maybe not everything that uh, people are looking for immediately. I think that probably covers us, and I don't want to run too far over. So maybe we can just redirect any questions to the end. But that sounds good, Marty. That sounds great. Thank you. And also, if you have yeah, other questions you, in chat that don't get answered, thank you. If we have other questions that don't get answered and you put them in the chat, I can send them out to our speakers as well. Thank you, Mark. So I'm going to turn this over now to Julian, uh, who's going to review telemetry. Julian? Are yep. you there? Okay, go right ahead. I'm there. Oh, well, yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Julian. I'm the PGL for uh, Cinometer, the Open Space Telemetry Project. So, I'm going to Talk about you a bit about what we did in Havana and what we're going to do in Icehouse. So first, um, the state of the project as it is uh, right now, we know have an option name, so you saw it. It's Open Space Telemetry. Uh, we voted on that a few weeks ago. Um, it has been accepted, so we are pretty happy about it. And, um, Analyze our first integrated release. So, what does that mean for us? Um, back to Grizzly, we were only uh, in a state where we were part of the release, but um, didn't have any photo on uh, security, stable releases, or things like that. Um, so, starting with Avana, this is the case. We are now handled by the security team, by the stable release team, etc. So it's a 
lot better now, and it's going to continue, obviously, for ourselves, etc. Uh, we also saw a large community growth. Um, the graph shows that, uh, well, I think we kind of doubled our number of contributors and commits. So it's, I think it's rather good. So now I'm going to talk about uh, what we uh, did during the Avala cycle. So the first feature we implemented is uh, the UDP transport. So if you know Cinemator, we you know that we use so far the um, RPC mechanism to transport our, um, our samples. But the problem that we you might have with the RPC mechanism is that it can be slow. Um, it is uh, stateless and it relies on a broker, and there are certain number of use cases like the alarming one, which I will talk about later, where you don't necessarily need to have all these requirements. So the UDP transfer is faster, it's based on UDP, and stateless, and it uses a different encoding, which is a message pack, and that is lighter than the JSON one used in RPC. The only downside is that there's no data background sheet and the messages are not signed. But it's largely good enough uh, when you do things like a running. So this is the first thing we implemented in Avada. Then we improved our API. So we added a few um, things in the API, like the ability to uh, group the samples by fields. So when we request kilometer for samples, um, it's Usually you will get statistics, uh, like maximum, minimum, average, etc. But it's really interesting to be able to group the fields by other values, like you would do in SQL. So we added that for a certain amount of fields in the API. We also added a few um, uh, possibilities and filtering, like uh, limiting the number of replies you get in the API uh, when you look at samples. And we extended the API a bit and provided links um, to other resources when you look at samples. I think you can move to the next slide, uh, Margish. So while working on the API, um, we also added a few things for alarming, like the ability to send your own samples. So, so far, the only samples you were able to send to Cinemator were the one where we wrote posters. And you had to rely on the RPC mechanism. Uh, we extended that to the API, so you, know, you can now post your own samples both as an operator or as a user. So this is really interesting for your user as they are going to be able to leverage this to send their own metrics and use the statistics capabilities provided by Cinometer. Uh, it's, also, it's also usable sorry, for alarming. So typically, your user are going to be able to send all the metrics they want from them, their own application or things like that and be able to add this as a source for alarms. So it's a little thing that is needed when you want to build custom alarm for uh, it and other scanning, for example. Um, the next features we added, which is totally unrelated to that, are new storage backends. So we are now have two more. We add SQL so far and MongoDB. Uh, we now have a, a Apache HBase, uh, which is based on Hadoop, and IBM DB2. Um, this DB2 being the NoSQL one, uh, not the SQL one, which is all the famous. So it's kind of a new uh, product of IBM, I think. Uh, it's uh, both working, but don't have all the features you would uh, think, but it's not so bad. We also added the database CTL. 
So, so far in Cinemator, we stored a lot of data, a lot of samples. Thus, you had no way to search all this data. Uh, and that's a lot of data. Uh, we know that you would call the Cinemator Explorer, which is able to drop all the old data you don't want anymore. So you can configure a global uh, time to leave for your samples, and the script will delete everything that isn't needed anymore. We are also at the RPV support. Um, so this is uh, if you run Windows Server uh, in your Nova uh, Nova Cloud, you're going to be able to uh, use Cinemator to retrieve disk network and CPU usage statistics. Uh, you can move to the next. Slide, I think, yeah, that's about the Hyper V. And the next one is being about the new meters we added. So we added the API endpoint um, uh, meter. So this is used to meter the number of requests that you are going to uh, to see on your endpoints like Metro, Glance, Novasis, etc. And we also added uh, the natural bandwidth meter. So this one is a bit heavier. It's largely based on a feature that was added in Notron during uh, the Havana development cycle. Uh, so Notron has not the ability to um, monitor the bandwidth used at the L3 router. And it sends uh, notifications to Cinovator with the number of bytes and packets going in and out of this router. And Cinemeter is able to um, monitor that and to retrieve these notifications and build new samples to meter the number of bytes, packets, etc., for each of our tenants. So this is really useful in cases where you want to build for bandwidth. Uh, so all of us, um, I just chill a slide. Uh, but you can move to the next one to uh, Margie. Yep, alarm. So, uh, what are alarms about? It's about watching um, metro statistics and um, trigger actions. Action being whatever you want. It can be uh, a webhook, sending an email, an SMS, whatever, based on social crossings. So, the schema just in the next slide. Uh, show the bit how it works. So the API endpoint is uh, used like for any of our clients. And the, it's used by the alarm evaluator. So it's a daemon that ev evaluates all the alarms. It retrieves via the API every once in a while. And it, it triggers an alarm as soon as the threshold is closed. Uh, for example, if you set an alarm of a uh, CPU meter as soon as the CPU usage is above 50%, it's going to um, trigger an alarm and send um, an action to do to another daemon, which is the Cinemeter Alarm Notifier. And this one is going to take action and do something like call a webhook, send an SMS, an email, whatever. Uh, all of this system is pluggable, so you can, I mean, invent your own action set like, I don't know, some a different type of message or anything else. It's based on uh, the standard symmetry architecture, so there's no, um, nothing new we invented there. There's different types of alarms, uh, so the threshold alarms, which are the simple ones, you just uh, send something, like I was saying. Uh, you do something as soon as the CPU usage goes over the threshold. And there's a second chart, which are the combination alarms. So it's just a logical combination of the uh, any alarm, being the combination alarm itself, or a threshold alarm. So it's uh, like the example which on the slide, just do something as soon as this alarm and this alarm are triggered. Uh, we also started in Havana something that we will continue, I hope, during ISOs, which is the event storage. So um, 
All we do so far in Cinometer is ritual notifications, which are some upon events in our open side components, being Nova, Neutron, Glance, etc. Um, we want to leverage this and to store these events for a lot of different reasons, being the ability to regenerate samples and to have an audit of what and how we did generate this sample in the first place. Uh, it's also useful to generate new sample that we didn't think about back then. Um, when you do a sort of inline in stream processing of events and generate samples on the fly, you can sometimes forget, forget to uh, generate some samples because you didn't have the ID back then to generate them. So this solves this kind of issue. Uh, it's, a lot, it's also required for some people in some country to have a development accounting, so to have two different sources to prove that you're going to, for example, build your customer uh, for something, you have to prove uh, that it's I mean, it was a real sample you got from a real event. So I think it's stored twice uh, as a lot with that. So this is not yet complete. Uh, we only, I think, did 20% or 30% of the work that is needed to, to have something working. But it's, it has been starting in a large part. And we had a lot of discussion during Havana. And we're going to continue on that on iOS. So I'm going to uh, present you uh, things we're going to do in Ice House, I think, uh, if the roadmap doesn't change. So a few general improvements first. Uh, we are going to split the collector in two logical pieces. So this has been released um, a few weeks ago in Ice House 1. Um, we now have a different uh, demon that handles notification events. Uh, before, we had only one at uh, the collector, and we now have a notification collector and a collector, which makes Simulator a bit more scalable. Uh, we are going to change uh, the way we send uh, samples. So far, we use the RPC mechanism being a function call. Um, we want to change that and leverage the notification system once again, because it's lighter and faster. Um, both our main drivers, SQL Alchemy and MongoDB, were not really on parity in terms of features and, well, I say bug, but uh, we're going to try to improve that. Um, we are, have been working a lot of building integration testing between uh, SQL, Mongo, and Cilometer to be sure that everything is working for real. Uh, and there's also a um, couple of people wanting to work on the hardware monitoring support being uh, for ironic or not. Um, on the API side, uh, there was a lot of proposals, uh, likely the ability to uh, build complex filtering and query. So what could be the ability to, for example, uh, include a logical or in your query request for this or that which is not possible right now in the API. You would have to do two distinct queries. So we'd like to be able to do that in only one. Uh, we're also building a new endpoint in the version 2 API being samples, uh, which is the same as Meter, but without the Meter name. Uh, this has been partially merged already, so it might be in ISOS 2 in a couple of weeks. Uh, we would also like to add things like returning the rate rather than actual value for a certain type of counter. Typically, if you use the uh, bandwidth counter, it's more useful in certain cases to add the number of bytes per second than the number of bytes. Uh, we would also like to add more statistic functions and the bulk request super which would be the ability to retrieve a lot of samples in one query. Uh, the other part should see a few new features too, like uh, improving the number of samples used to build uh, the threshold, um, the ability to add time constraints to alarms, like only uh, trigger this alarm if it's 3 a.m. Otherwise, I don't want you to trigger it. Uh, that's 
uh, useful for certain use cases such as auto scaling needs. Um, the last one is about distributed pooling. So uh, it's, it's, uh, we have a lot of problems in matter about scalability and uh, averaging meters uh, among a large number of, of compute nodes or things like that. Uh, it's, and it's a common pattern we saw in other projects like uh, Nova or Neutron. So we discussed a bit in the Oslo project to solve this solution at a larger scale. And we started a project which is Tuz. And there was already a project called Dataflow um, to solve all of, all of that. Uh, being the ability to distribute the polling we do in kilometer. So there is currently there is only one demanding all the polling of all the platform being the kilometer central agent. Um, this is not very scalable obviously. So we're working on that during the ice house. I hope we will have something ready by the end of ice house, but it takes time to build this library. Um, we would also like to replace our custom distri alarm distributor we use in the kilometer uh, subsystem right now. We wrote our own so far to have something working, but we know it's not a perfect solution, so we're trying to, to be better, to be better for uh, the ice house for this. Um, I think that's all for the new feature we'd like to add in in ice house, so if you have any questions. Um, just yell or write in the chat or get to answer. Thanks, Julian. So the lines are open if anyone has any questions for Julian. Or you can put it in the chat box. Anyone? Or if not, we can also go over it at the end as well. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, Julian. So I'm going to turn this over to John uh, regarding block storage. So let me pull that open. Thank you very much. One second. John, are you there? I am. Okay. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, wherever it might be where you're at. Um, I'm John Griffith. I am the current PTL for the Block Storage Project in OpenStack. I've been working on the Block Storage Project for, uh, well, basically since it started. Um, but Grizzly was the first release, and then Havana is our, our second release. Um, so today I just wanted to go through and just sort of go through some of the highlights about Havana, uh, sort of where we're at, what kind of the stats were. So if you take a look here, we have a number of commits, um, up to 843 total commits, lines of code, number of views, so on and so forth. So these, these numbers are all, you know, they're interesting um, by themselves to look at and get an idea of, of how active a project is and what's going on and stuff like that. Um, so you can look at these and, and see that there's a, a pretty, good, pretty good amount of activity taking place in the uh, block storage project. But what's more interesting is if you go to the next slide, if you look at the um, growth from one project to the next, or one release to the next. So um, I went ahead and took a look at the uh, deltas of those same numbers between Grizzly and Havana, um, and you know saw some some things that that to me seem like healthy growth in the project. Um, so the number of commits we increased by 400. Um, you know lines of code went up significantly. That's not always good. Um, however, in this particular release, we did a lot of things to uh, move some code out into uh, into libraries and things like that, um, and we added a lot of unit testing. So a lot of that lines of code that you see there is actually unit testing. Um, and then of course there are new drivers that came into play uh, with this release, and that always is is a significant amount of, of LOC that gets added. Um, what's really cool is the number of reviews. Um, if you look at that and the number of contributors. Those are my two, uh, the two that I really like to see. Um, number of reviews went up significantly. It went way up. Um, 
and even more importantly, the number of contributors increased. Um, so, you know, we're up positive 74 in the no number of contributors for the Havana cycle. So, um, you know, that's, that's great news and it's a great sign that, that the block storage project is still growing. New people are getting involved um, and interested in, in working on it and stuff like that. Um, so that's great. Those are all great things to see in my opinion. So, so if you want to go to the, yeah. So some of the things that I wanted to call out, um, you know, particularly in terms of the, the community activity and the things that have been going on inside of uh, Cinder. Um, one of the things that Cinder has done in terms of uh, requirements and, and things like that, um, we have a we have an interesting challenge because it's you know block storage. There's a lot of vendors that want to participate, and there's a lot of devices out there, and and keeping everything common and keeping everything working can be somewhat of a challenge um, to make every everybody actually kind of on the same level playing field. So um, a while back we, we kind of came up with this strategy that we were going to have minimum API requirements. So there was going to be a minimum set of API features and things in the in the Cinder project that every back end device that if it wanted to be have a driver included inside of OpenStack and it wanted to be supported, it would have to meet those minimum requirements. Um, so we started that and, and we, we came up with this scheme of, of basically everybody would have one release basically to get up to date if they were out of date. Um, and the great thing was in Havana everybody really, uh, all, the, all the different vendors and the maintainers and, and even folks that had no relation to the vendors of those drivers um, really got involved and, and got all of those drivers up to date and, and got those minimum requirements all implemented. Um, so that was a really cool thing to see, and it, it worked out really well. Um, I think it gives a, a great uh, experience for, for the end users and for the people that want to adopt OpenStack. Um, and I also think it's, it's a big attribute to, um, or a big testament to, to open source and, and how OpenStack can actually work. Um, you know, one of the other things I wanted to note was, uh, you know, some folks that had been absent from the OpenStack world that had committed in the past, um, uh, had, had come back. Uh, Nixenta in particular came back this uh, Havana cycle and, and contributed a lot and in, in not only to their driver but they also contributed a lot in terms of discussions and roadmap plan planning and, and things like that and, and put forth a lot of effort and helped out a lot. So I wanted to put a special shout out to them there. Um, in addition we had you know some, some new drivers come into play um, which is always always a good thing. Um, VMware uh, got really involved um, and did a lot of work, uh, not only for their VMDK support, but also other areas of the project as well. Um, so the, the things that, that I really like to see from, you know, when, when vendors in particular get involved and they want to add a driver or add a back end, um, the thing that's really cool to see is when they actually also contribute to the rest of the project as well and they help out with, with reviews, they help out with Im improvements, you know, in other facets of the project. So that was a really good thing to see. And then also um, uh, Dell came into the, into the fold this release as well with their Equalogic project. Um, so that, that's good to see as well. All right, we can go to the next one. So uh, some of the features that we covered here um, in Havana that came out, uh, I'll, I'll kind of step through some of these. I, I hate to just read bullet items on a slide, but I'm gonna I want to talk a little bit about each one. Um, <clears throat> encryption. Uh, if you're not familiar, the discussions around encryption and the idea of doing uh, encrypted volumes started way back uh, at the probably at the Grizzly uh, Summit, or actually at the summit in Portland is when we started that. So the Havana Summit. Um, we started those talks, um, we had a lot of different ideas um, and you know through a lot of hard work from the folks at Johns Hopkins um, and some other people we, we actually got a pretty cool system in place now to, to handle encryption. So um, that's something that if, if you haven't looked at it, um, definitely take a look. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty neat feature um, and I think going forward we'll, we'll do things like uh, look at how to expose uh, the encryption that the back end devices actually support as well. Uh, right now that's more of an encryption that does even over the wire encryption. So uh, something to look into and it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, one of the other things that we did was we moved to uh, using task flow. So Cinder project got to be 
sort of a gu guinea pig for the task flow uh, project. Um, and it worked out pretty well. So, so the concept of task flow, if you're not familiar with it, you should check it out. Um, but it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, managing state transitions and, and doing rollbacks and things like that. Um, so for the first, first step, uh, Josh Harlow from Yahoo went ahead and, and did a, a significant amount of work to implement that for our create volume uh, workflow. Um, so that just continues to grow. Uh, we continue to make improvements and, and learn as we go. Um, I think it's going to help in the long run significantly with some of the problems that we've had traditionally with, with block storage with being stuck in certain states, whether that be error on creating or whatever, things like that. So, um, so that'll be good. Um, you know, a while back we introduced the concept of, of backups. We introduced a backup service into Cinder, um, and those backups basically are just currently they were well they were just doing um, taking a, a block storage device and saying back it up to an object store. Um, that's continued to mature. Uh, it's continuing to get better. Um, I, I think we've still got a ways to go. Um, there's some some things that we need to to uh, continue to, to finish there and get implemented uh, to make it a true DR uh, type of type of operation. Um, but it's it's definitely grown. It's definitely getting some interest. Um, we've we started off with Swift, of course, as the backup target. We've also added um, Ceph's Object Store. Uh, the Tivoli Storage Manager folks from from IBM actually added a driver as well. Uh, so if you're if you're traditional tape folks, um, you can you can use that as well. So so that's uh, so that's something that we're definitely working on, and we continue to to push forward, and I think is going to be extremely useful for folks in the future. Um, the extend volume, uh, you know, that's that started out as resize volume, <laughs> and it changed to extend volume. We we kind of started down the path of doing resizes, um, and it, there, there's some caveats and things, you know, some pitfalls and stuff with uh, reducing the size of volume if a user has a file system on it. And, and we wanted to kind of think through some of those things and figure out how we wanted to control that, whether it be through a policy to allow it or whatever, or you know, flash warning messages or something like that. But we want to do something to make sure that, you know, we don't let people just completely shoot themselves in the foot there. So, so for now, right now we have just the extend volume, uh, which still is, is a great feature. Um, in addition, we added rate limiting support. So there are some backends that, that do uh, quality of service, and, and we have, we've had that sort of functionality implemented through extra specs. Um, <clears throat> we've also now added a more general rate limiting uh, feature as well. Um, that rate limiting typically works uh, by rate limiting on the hypervisor, um, but you set that on the volume inside of Cinder. So there's some, some pretty neat things there, uh, some really useful tools for people that, that folks have been asking for. So that's something else that you might want to take a look at too and, and get some more detail on. Um, we did a lot of work to clean up the boot from volume integration. Uh, in the past, you know, boot from volume, we made it you know, significantly better in Grizzly, uh, in my opinion, than it was, was prior to that. Um, however, we, you know, we did not have support in Horizon, and, and there were some things there that um, just made it still a little bit clunky. You had to go to Cinder and do a bunch of steps, and then go to Nova and do a bunch of steps, and you just couldn't do any of it from Horizon, really. Um, so now that is all integrated inside of Horizon and Nova, which is fantastic. So you can go directly to Nova and, and make the create volume, you know, bootable volume calls and everything, and you can also do that from Horizon. The implementation of Horizon came out really, really nice. Um, so I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Um, one of the other really neat features, in my opinion, that we introduced was um, the ability to transfer volumes. Uh, so we implemented a method where uh, uh, tenant A can go ahead and say, hey, I want to give this volume, uh, this particular volume up to another tenant. Um, basically what it does is it generates a key. Uh, the, the tenant, um, uh, the transfer create call in the API creates a key, and then that tenant who created that can give that key to whoever they like uh, in that OpenStack, you know, in that cloud deployment. Um, and then that tenant can do a, a, a transfer take 
or transfer accept um, and enter that key and then we will go ahead and change all the permissions and, and everything on that volume um, <clears throat> to uh, basically give it, a, give it to the other tenant. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty handy feature. That's something a lot of folks were asking for. Um, in the future, we've, we've got some more, uh, some more to do on that. We're, we're going to kind of advance that whole concept and that idea, um, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the next thing that we added was uh, the ability to do volume migration. Uh, so that was kind of a, we're at the first step of that, and a lot of what was driving that was, um, you know, part of doing instance migration. Of course, if you have an attached volume, how do you, you know, what are you going to do there? So we went ahead and uh, actually the folks from IBM, Avishay Traeger, um, uh, worked really hard on the migration uh, code and, and implemented the ability to go ahead and migrate a volume from one sender node or backend device to another. Uh, so, so that's something, again, it's, you know, it's the first steps and, and we're, we're making progress and, and it's, it's a great feature. So. Uh, one of the other big milestones uh, that I wanted to just kind of touch on real quick is we introduced the version 2 uh, of our API. Um, <clears throat> a lot of folks in, in the OpenStack world see an API version bump and, and think, oh no, here we go, you know, this is going to be bad. Uh, we, we I, I think, anyway, I think we really learned from some of the mistakes that we've seen in the past and some of the things that happened in the past. And, and we really uh, strive to, to make a fully compatible, backward compatible uh, uh, version bump. So, um, so far the feedback has been excellent. Um, you know, people, there hasn't been uh, any significant gotchas, any significant problems or anything like that. Um, and, and we added a number of new features, cleaned up quite a few things in the code. Um, so. The, VT, the V2 API is, is something that's really great. Um, if, if you haven't looked at it, if you're not using it, um, I, I highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, and if you, you know, if you do run into some sort of problems or some sort of compatibility issues that we haven't caught, um, you know, let us know. We'll definitely, we'll definitely take a look at it and get it taken care of. So, um, all right. So what's next? Um, so it's kind of odd talking about this um, halfway through the, or not halfway, but almost halfway through the ice house cycle. Um, but it's actually really good because if, if you've ever been to a design summit, you know it's, it's a flurry of activity and ideas and, and you know, then we try and give a, a project update and say what we're going to do and it's like, well, we talked about a million things and I, I have in no way prioritized them or scaled them down or figured out what's actually going to work. So, so this is actually really good. Um, the, the things that we're, you know, that we're definitely focusing on um, and, and making good progress on so far are things like a driver cert program. And the idea there is uh, one of the things that, that you have in a situation like the block storage project is you have all these different vendor backends, all these different products, um, but none of them are actually gated in our CI. So OpenStack has probably the greatest um, CI um, framework and everything put together that, that I've ever seen. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. We do a tremendous amount of testing and gating on every patch that goes into, uh, into the code base. Um, and that's great. However, we have absolutely no automated testing or checking of all of these third-party products. Um, and I mean, it's obvious there's, there's a good reason why, you know, having 20 different uh, back-end storage devices all in our OpenStack infrastructure is, is not something we can really do. Um, so the concept of the driver cert program is um, we want to, going forward, we want to actually log public information about every driver inside of Cinder. Um, and, and the idea here would be uh, we would probably start by logging a bug against every, every driver and saying, hey, this driver hasn't passed the cert for this release. Um, and then there's an automated test now inside of DevStack uh, that they can run. So they can do all of this in a DevStack environment, attach their device in their lab, um, run the CERT program. It will run through the standard gating test that we do today for the, for the reference implementation driver, um, collect the results, and submit them. Uh, so basically it's just a way to get some public information that says, hey, yes, 
we did test this, and yes, it does work. Here's the results. Um, it's, it's not perfect. It's not flawless, but it's it's a first step, um, and I th I think it's a, a good direction to go um, in terms of getting information out there and, and letting people know this is what works and this is what doesn't, um, or this is what's being actively maintained and this is what isn't. Um, one of the other things that's coming online in IceHouse is um, uh, replication. Uh, so if any of you were at the OpenStack Israel, you, you, you may have saw um, Florian's uh, discussion about uh, uh, asynchronous replication and Cinder and things like that. Um, so we're not, we're, we're definitely not there yet. We are definitely, uh, it's definitely a work in progress. The first steps right now are on-demand replication uh, being exposed in the API, uh, and that's a great first step. And that's, uh, you know, we need to start there. So that's, that's going to be fantastic. Um, that's moving along really well, and, and that should be, that should be uh, showing up here in the, the I2 release. So uh, the next thing we have is local storage scheduling. Um, so the concept here is to actually be able to, so currently you use Cinder and you say, let's, let's say, for example, if you're using the reference implementation, the LVM driver, you're creating a logical volume on a Cinder node and exporting it via iSCSI to your compute node, doing the attach, et cetera, et cetera. The idea here is um, we would like to be able to take this concept and do things like have Cinder say, hey, create me a LVM, a logical volume, but create it on the compute node that the instance is residing on or is going to reside on. Um, so that's, that's kind of the direction we're going with that. Um, We've talked about this for a while and, and just never really uh, dug in and got it done. And I think in Icehouse, I think we're, we're going to get there. Um, I, I'm hoping to, to find the cycles to work on that. I've started laying a lot of groundwork for it. So I think we'll get that in Icehouse. If not, it will be in very early in the, in the Juno release. Um, the next thing that we have is volume retype. Um, so one of the things in OpenStat or in Cinder right now is we rely heavily on the concept of uh, volume types and extra specs. So those volume types and extra specs are basically um, used heavily for a couple of things. One is uh, if you have a Cinder deployment that has multiple backend devices, um, that's the method that we use to control which backend device a, a, a request is deployed on. Um, in addition, we also use that to do things like expose custom functionality that that backend might have. Um, so the idea of a retype is a user can go in and create a volume of type A, for example, um, and then say later down the road they may have some requirements that they need uh, thin provisioning support, they need QoS support, they need um, you know, some, some sort of uh, other feature, uh, whatever it might be, uh, for that particular data set. What they can do at that point then is they can go ahead and do what's called a retype, and that retype will go ahead and uh, if that type, if that new type that's requested can be served by the same backend device, that's great. Um, what we do is we just change the parameters and the characteristics of the of the volume, um, and everything's good. If it can't, we'll actually uh, provide the ability for you to go ahead and do a migrate. So that's where the migrate uh, code that we talked about before comes in. So. Everything in, in Cinder we kind of do in steps and, and we kind of build on it. So you can kind of see that with retype. So go to the next slide. So that's, uh, I blew through those pretty quick, but um, hopefully there's some questions. It looks like there's a few over there. You'll have to forgive my cold. Um, I'm just going down. How is, is this for you? How is rate limiting with volumes implemented in IceHouse? Meaning, is this an IOPS bandwidth or? Whoops, I missed the end of that. IOPS or bandwidth. <laughs> or, um, or if I knew how to scroll correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Crowther. And we, I think we have about five minutes, too. So I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead, John. Sure. So, um, yeah. So, so currently, it's, it's a rate limiting based on IOPS. Um, you, you can take a look, and, and it's partially dependent. That generalized method that I talked about is, is 
really completely dependent upon the um, uh, the hypervisor at this point. Uh, so mostly libvirt. Um, but you can look inside of libvirt. It gives you the ability to do things like rate limiting on on read IOPS, write IOPS, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's what that general implementation is right now. There are also back-end devices um, that allow you to do things like set quality of service um, and, and do it, you know, more fine-grained or, or, you know, depending on how you, how you look at it, um, you, you can call it different things. But there are some that let you do things like actually set a minimum uh, and maximum IOP level um, and actually guarantee those levels. Um, there's others that allow you to do general things like, you know, fast, medium, slow. They do things like take a look at their overall IOP capability and, and will do things to try and reserve that, that level for you. Um, so there, there's a lot of options right there. Um, the, uh, the, the general implementation, like I said, is, is something you'll have to look at um, in terms of, of using the hypervisor to actually do throttling. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's something that folks have asked for. It's something fairly new in, in LibVirt, so, um, so that's implemented. And, and when you're looking at that, one of the things you have to look at is what we did is we went ahead and grouped that under um, a thing called QoS specs. So you actually create a QoS spec to do that and assign it to a type. So. Um, and Jeff, you have a question there. Is there any QoS to ensure certain levels of performance? Um, the, the answer to that is yes, um, depending on your back end. Um, so some backends do that, some backends don't. Um, you know, SolidFire is an example of one that will, will allow you to, to do that guarantee. Um, there, there's, I believe there's some other ones uh, you'd have to do some research, but I don't want to get into, you know, specific vendors and what they're doing. That's not a specific Cinder function or a Cinder implementation um, as of today, so hopefully that works. And hey, great. Oh, oh. oh, no, was there another one? I think. Uh, it looks like Rushi is answering some questions. <laughs> so. I think he was just helping me. Thank you, Rushi. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are a few minutes over. Thank you so much, John. Um, sure. I know we had three speakers today, so I appreciate everyone's use of time. Um, if you have any additional questions, you can send them back to the foundation and I can get them back to Mark and Julian and John because I think there's a follow-up email that everyone receives. So once again, thank you Mark, Julian, John for your time today and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.